here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. News primetime on the ATL starts now. Democrats in a very difficult position trying to fill the political seat of the late Representative John Lewis as we remember the life of this American legend. He spent his entire adult life fighting for justice and equality for all Americans, and he had the courage to risk his life to promote change. From lunch counter sit-ins to freedom rides, he escaped death just barely back in the 1960s. He was the youngest and the last surviving speaker from the 1963's March on Washington. After years of fighting in the movement and decades in Washington, D.C., in Congress, he never stopped. He never lost his energy or his desire or his will to go on. He would spend 33 years serving Georgia's 5th Congressional District until the day he died. Yeah, Jeff, as you said, Congressman Lewis never wavered. One piece of legislation took him 15 years to pass, and our Joe Henke has a look at the vote that Lewis called perhaps the most important of his or any other representative's careers. Representative John Lewis spent nearly half of his years in Washington fighting to build a museum for African American history. And when it finally opened, he told us he found himself fighting once again, but that time to hold back tears. Representative John Lewis began pushing for the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 1988. For 15 years, he introduced a bill to build the museum, but continuously faced opposition. Very hard, very difficult, almost impossible for us to get it through the Senate because of one senator by the name of Jesse Hems from the state of North Carolina. He did not want to see an African American museum on the mall. I insist that it must be on the mall. I call the mall the front porch of America. It should be near the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument. Lewis's bill finally passed in 2003, but it took another 13 years to see the museum open. He called the 2016 opening a dream come true. We must tell the story, the whole story, 400 years story of African-American contribution to this nation's history from slavery to the present without anger or apology. The bill behind this museum, perhaps the most important bill to Lewis that he authored, but he called the 2010 Affordable Health Care Act vote a defining moment. This may be the most important vote that we cast as members of this body. We have a moral obligation today, tonight, to make health care a right and not a privilege. Today, Democrats named Atlanta State Senator Nikema Williams to replace the late congressman on the November election ballot. She will be on the ballot facing a Republican reality show star in November. 11 Livestock Richards has more on Williams and how she got here. 
The vote by the Georgia Democratic Executive Committee, which it did in public on a Zoom call, makes Nakima Williams the automatic favorite to win the 5th Congressional District seat in one of the most Democratic districts in the country. I've considered myself a student of the John Lewis School of Politics. Nakima Williams quickly became the frontrunner as the Democratic Party of Georgia solicited applications over the weekend from anybody who wanted to succeed Lewis. Morehouse College President Emeritus Robert Franklin was one of them. We are all sons and daughters of John uh, Lewis. Although Lewis died July 17th, his name is still on the ballot in the November election facing a reality show star, Republican Angela Stanton King. By Sunday's deadline, the state party had 131 online applications to become the Democrats' replacement for Lewis. The party's nominating committee, which included Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and former candidates for Governor Stacey Abrams and Jason Carter, narrowed down the list to five finalists by late morning today. The finalists were Senator Williams, State Representative Park Cannon, Atlanta City Councilman Andre Dickens, Robert Franklin, and James Major Woodall, president of the Georgia NAACP. I would become the first openly queer woman, member of Congress. Representative Cannon finished a distant second in the voting. Williams' support came from her presence as chair of the state Democratic Party, bolstered by her arrest at the state capitol in 2018 during a protest that echoed the civil rights arrests of Congressman Lewis. He showed me the value of putting myself, sometimes physically, in between the dangerous policies that the most vulnerable communities are hurt by. The Democrats were on a tight deadline. They had to formally submit Williams' nomination at the state capitol by 4.30 p.m., and they took the vote with about two hours to spare. Well, ever since he passed away, people have been gathering at the 55-foot mural on Auburn Avenue remembering Congressman Lewis. It reflects his reputation as a civil rights giant, and yet throughout the years, he continued to remind people you don't have to be a giant to make a change. We asked Atlantans about what his message meant to them. We grew up in Atlanta, born and raised at Grady. Um, John Lewis meant a lot to the community, and he meant a lot to me. Because just growing up, uh, knowing what he sacrificed. I think it is just um, of importance to educate, especially our younger generations, to know the importance of this man that passed away and his legacy. The things that they did paved the way for people of color like me to enjoy what we are enjoying now. I never actually met okay uh, john lewis but i did attend a program where he spoke and just left a great impact on my life with his memories a lot of the things he had to endure john lewis had to stand up he did and i feel like that's what we need to do now is we need to show up to show other people that we are here for them it's our calling to continue to do his work and to continue to fight injustice and to um, raise our voices we continue to remember Congressman Lewis throughout tonight's shows. Coming up in the next half hour, his legacy of leadership and how he has inspired another generation of young people all over the world to fight for education, representation, and equality. Well, the heat and the humidity is causing more of those heat of the day storms to pop up like popcorn across the Atlanta area, all across North Georgia. And it's almost like the popcorn kernels have just been scattered across the countertop because it's not like they're all organized. They're just very hit or miss storms and they're not lasting long like this one that's working its way up 75, worked its way through McDonough and into Stockbridge where it just fell apart. The same thing happened in Southwest Atlanta with that cell we were watching at seven o'clock. And also here on the north side, this one is strengthening as it moves over uh, 85 to the north towards the split, the 985 split. So just west of Lawrenceville, some uh, lightning strikes associated with that and some very heavy downpours. The red color there on the radar indicates heavy rain. And also an isolated heavy downpour here just northwest of Bremen with some lightning associated with it as well. So there are few and far between, but where it's coming down, it is coming down pretty heavily. You get us some gusty damaging winds with these thunderstorms as well as that frequent lightning and that heavy rain. So that's going to be the main threat. Can't rule out some hail either, although we haven't been seeing any reports of hail with these storms today. But we 
can't totally rule that out. And that chance for severe, that level one chance across northeast Georgia as we head into the evening hours. So we'll continue to see these storms kind of weaken after sunset. So by the time we head into the overnight hours, we'll have some clouds out there. And then things starting out on the quiet side tomorrow with more storms to come. And we'll time those out coming up in just a few minutes. Those who live in Castleberry Hill are upset. They say late night drag racing, large crowds and weapons. They are in fear for their lives. 11 Alive Chenu Her spoke to some of those neighbors. Neighbors in Castleberry Hill say they're tired of this. Late night, loud drag racing. Callie McConnell and her boyfriend George Boone live near the intersection of Peter Street and Fair Street. They say the drag racing has been going on for weeks. On Saturday, they saw and heard it outside their home. And it saw uh, a bunch of cars starting to pull up and starting to rev their engines and do burnouts on their, of their tires. She took this video showing a car doing donuts in the street surrounded by a huge crowd. This lasted for probably 45 minutes to an hour directly in front of where we live. Atlanta police say when they got on the scene, the crowd of people and cars scattered. Officers stopped multiple cars, one dirt bike, and seven ATVs. APD cited one driver. Georgia State Police handled the rest. But neighbor Jacob Burkhardt says it was the same scene Sunday night in the same place. Another man who lives in that area sent us these videos he says he took Sunday night. They back up what Burkhart describes. Burnouts, uh, commercial grade fireworks like those mortar shells um, that were going, you know, within feet of people's homes. Burkhart says he called Atlanta police. In the same video taken by a man Sunday night, you can see police later blocking off the street. These neighbors are desperately asking for help, not wanting things to escalate. You saw people on the streets with guns and you don't know what they're going to do. They could start shooting into our homes. There's just a lot of potential for things to go wrong. It wouldn't take much for something really bad to happen. Tonight, another school district is walking back its plans to reopen as COVID-19 cases hit a new record high over the weekend. Gwinnett County Public Schools now going fully digital for at least the first several weeks of the upcoming mm -hmm. school year. Originally, families were given a choice of in-person or online learning. So educators in the county gather this morning for a rally, saying there's a lot the district needs to address before starting classes. Teachers say they want the option of working from home or from the classroom, and some say the digital divide is still a problem for many children in the district. Owen Lopez explains. There was inequity in education even before the pandemic. Now with online learning, there's growing concern some might fall behind even further. Access to a computer and internet seem nearly essential as COVID-19 continues to close classroom doors, shifting learning from a pencil to a click. But access has proven to be a challenge for many Hispanic and African American students. I feel like this is just another variable, another layer added that helps widen that gap. And then some of our kids might not ever get out of that. And that definitely worries me. Nudie Castillo Crawford is an academic director at Gwinnett County Public Schools. She also leads the district's Hispanic mentorship program. I think all of us just want what's best for our kids. A survey by Somos found in April that amid the pandemic, nearly 40% of Latinos did not have broadband internet access at home and 32% did not have a computer. The divide is felt in Gwinnett County, where Hispanic and Latino students make up 32% of the district, compared to 21% who identify as Caucasian. And I had parents tell me, you know, we walked with a Chromebook to McDonald's and we sat outside in the parking lot, you know, not even in a car. And she was like, we sat outside with my two kids and we did, they did their work outside in a parking lot at McDonald's. As Gwinnett prepares for its public schools to start virtually, Castillo says the school district will provide hotspots and laptops to those in need, but there is still some concern for households with more than one student. You know, there's families that they have a elementary, middle school and high school kids and they cannot provide laptops. Probably they have one laptop for the whole entire family. Some educators also told me that another challenge that some parents faced when trying to gain internet access was that some of these companies were asking parents to provide their social security numbers. And while many immigrants don't even have one, others just didn't feel comfortable <laughs> providing one.
Well, things certainly have changed for a lot of school districts on all levels of education for the past few weeks or in the past few weeks and days. We have a full breakdown of what parents need to know district by district. You can find our story on 11alive.com or inside our 11alive app. Still ahead with so many districts going online in the fall, parents forming learning pods, small groups of kids who have a privately hired teacher, but there are concerns. Maybe this is widening the education gap. Don't forget, we're streaming right now at Love and Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe. All you got to do is go in on the community section and have your voice heard. We have more on 11 Alive News in prime time right after the break. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently. With memories and praise pouring in from all over the world for Congressman John Lewis, we spoke with the Southwest Atlanta woman who has some very unique memories of the maker of good trouble. And I realized what we did and what we went through and the danger that we were in. Very few of us remember Congressman John Lewis like Alice Thomas Moore. Memories like joining Lewis's Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC movement in 1965. A foot soldier at only 16 and fighting for her parents' right to vote. Uh, yeah, he was very energetic and uh, I, back then I was 16 years old and he was in his 20s and uh, we just thought he was just fantastic. He, he was very, uh, very outspoken and uh, very forceful and, and very determined to do uh, what we needed to do and to teach us to do what we needed to do. And he was teaching us the nonviolent way of marching and protesting. And Alice joined Lewis in the basement of the now famous Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma, taking in his every word. And she had to. Alice was arrested three times, even spending some time in a prison camp as a teenager. It just gave me more determination to go back for the next uh, the next trial. That next trial came quicker than she thought. Alice joined Lewis on the march now known as Bloody Sunday. She braved the threat of tear gas and violence and even saw Lewis on the ground, bloody and beaten. An image she remembers as if it were yesterday, 55 years later. I can still, I can still see him bloody at that one point that I did see him, yes. But she says Lewis never wavered from his mission, voting rights for all. It was kind of profound and and exciting that you knew somebody of that magnitude that had worked so hard and done the things that he had done and fighting for the things that he had taught me to fight for because he helped teach me what to fight for because I knew what I wanted for my parents to vote and I knew that's what I was fighting for. And Alice got just what she marched for. That August after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, her parents registered to vote. That my father, I was just so happy because he, the main one that, you know, he got to vote before he left this world, you know, he got to vote. 
Alice Thomas Moore also tells us that she has a new mission now. She wants to see the bridge renamed after Congressman Lewis. A lot of folks in that camp right now as well. She said name the day and she'll be there fighting for it. We are live in a live storm trackers tracking some thunderstorms out there tonight. None have been severe, but some of them have been pretty strong out here. Uh, many of them, though, not moving anywhere any too quickly. So they're just kind of stationary and they rain themselves out like this one that was along 75, moved from McDonough into Stockbridge and just kind of died out. We had one in southwest Atlanta, still a little bit of light rain there south of I-20, but not what we saw earlier with those heavier downpours. Heaviest storm right now, or the strongest storm, is right over 85, right before the 985-85 split west of Lawrenceville. Quite a bit of heavy rain here coming down and some lightning. Five strikes in the past 15 minutes, so uh, things are probably sounding pretty loud and with the gusty winds associated with this thunderstorm the winds are probably blowing pretty good for you over there as well and in Bremen we've had this little cell we are tracking but it looks to be weakening too so these cells not sticking around long as they continue to bring in a little bit of cooling for the neighborhoods when uh, the rain comes down there so certainly we have that threat for severe yet tonight especially across far north Georgia that level one threat mainly it's going to be the damaging wind gusts and the lightning haven't had too many reports of hail this evening so that's not as much of an issue looking out over the city right now you can see some of the remnants of those thunderstorm clouds kind of floating above the city skyline and boy it was a hot one today the third day in a row we hit 95 degrees Degrees, and that is the hottest temperature we've had all this year. That is the hottest we've been so far this year, and we happen to be in a, in a very hot pattern where we have those 395 days in a row, 395 degree days in a row. 77 was a morning low, very mild start. We should be around 71 for a low and 89 for a high, so we're several degrees above average. And Athens today, 102. Oh my goodness, that is just incredibly hot. 99 in Eatonton, 99 in Rome. We are stuck in that uh, dog day of summer heat pattern. So we're looking at those temperatures now where we've gotten the rain. We're in the low to mid 80s. So a little bit of relief as these storms come in, but then it just starts heating up once again. And tomorrow, once again, we'll have that chance across far north Georgia for a level one risk of severe. And again, it's mainly the wind uh, a hail potential, a bit of a hail potential as well as some lightning. So on your Tuesday, a six on that wasometer on your scale of one to an 11 with an 11 being a perfect day. Temperatures getting into the mid 90s with uh, the possibility of those storms popping after lunchtime. In fact, that's what we're going to expect to see. Uh, afternoon, we should end up seeing just that slight chance for storms and then that chance building during the afternoon and evening hours. And those temperatures very warm. 100 to 105 is how it's going to feel. That feels like temperature with the heat and humidity and we'll still have those storms during the shower during the uh, afternoon and evening hours so active through this week into the weekend and into next week as well so there's a look at what we're expecting with the future radar showing a dry start to tomorrow it's still going to be sticky and humid and kind of uh, steamy out there, but it will not be active until after lunchtime. Then we'll see them popping up with some heavy downpours here, especially across the North Georgia mountains. That continues in through the evening hours. And then again, we're going to be able to do it on Wednesday the same way with some heavy downpours possible. The atmosphere is going to be moistening up even more midweek, so we could see some heavier rain out of those, and we can't rule out the possibility of severe. So 40% chance each and every day this week. Temperatures warm again tomorrow we should have another mid 90 degree day and then we'll see the temperatures trending down as the week progresses but we're staying active with those heat of the day storms clear through the beginning of next week today we learned the funeral plans of the reverend ct vivian who died the same day as congressman lewis reverend vivian a presidential medal of freedom winner uh, an early key advisor to dr king dr king once described him as the world's greatest preacher he participated in the freedom rides he was beaten he did the first sit-ins in Nashville in 1960 and 61. He challenged the mayor there when there was the issue of, of, uh, of systemic racism, and the mayor eventually agreed with him. Uh, he also has lived in Atlanta since 1975. His business called uh, Basic Diversity has been an absolute breakthrough business in the issue of race in the United States, uh, being used by Starbucks in Seattle to the Atlanta Hawks to Leadership Atlanta. His funeral will be small and private because of the pandemic. It is scheduled for 11 a.m. Thursday at Providence Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta. 
What a life. What a man. What a legacy. Unbelievable. We'll be right back. Outside workers, the best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their Many major school districts have announced that they will be fully virtual in the fall, and now parents are scrambling to figure out what that's going to look like. One solution is to form what is called pods with about four or five other kids in the same grade, and then one adult can facilitate virtual learning. But as Caitlin Ross reports, there are concerns it could create an even bigger gap among students based on what families can afford to pay. Every single parent wants the best education for their child, but so many families are now left feeling like there are no good options now that all of the learning will be virtual. If parents have to return to work, who can supervise their kid and make sure they get the best education? No one has ever been in this situation. School districts, we've never seen this pandemic before. Ty Lewis is an educator and runs Educationally Speaking, a tutoring program for children. And even she's worried about what school will look like once her husband returns to work in person. We have two young children, and sometimes my mom is up here and she has dementia, so she's high risk. She says the COVID-19 pandemic has turned education on its head. And now more than ever, families need to lean on each other to get through. A popular idea has been creating these learning pods for kids in the same grade. So when you're forming these villages, you're actually able to pull the resources from, again, educators and other people. She says most groups are forming online through Facebook and community organizers, but she's worried there will be inequity based on who is able to pay for something like that and who can't. Katie Whittlesley runs the nonprofit Education Cures and Homeschool Resource Academics Plus. She's worried about the same things. I've been fearful for our children. I mean, just absolutely terrified that there are so many, there's already a discrepancy. She says parents will have to advocate for their kids now that school will be online. We all have the power to make a difference in the life of one child. And it doesn't matter if you are a teacher or you're just a mom who cares. I think that this is the time to really jump in and help someone else. A lot of parents are finding these groups through local parenting sites on Facebook or their community websites. Usually someone will offer to host four or five children and then they'll supervise that learning online. Still ahead, not only did he fight for equality, without him, 
traffic might have been even worse here in Atlanta. How Congressman John Lewis was involved in one of the biggest freeway battles. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. While many of us know Congressman John Lewis for his fight for civil rights, did you know he was also part of what became the largest freeway revolt in the city's history? Now this goes back to before he became a congressman when Lewis was serving on Atlanta City Council. There were several different freeway plans they were discussing inside what is now I-285. One would have added an eight to 10 lane freeway running from the current south end of Georgia 400 southward to connect with I-675 to the south of Atlanta. Lewis opposed it and he helped broker an alternative use for the space, which turned into Freedom Parkway, opening in the 90s before the Olympics. There's, of course, that green space there that later became the Carter Center. <clears throat> later, Freedom Parkway was named after Lewis in 2018. Congressman Lewis made it his life's work to fight voter suppression and to ensure representation for all Americans. 11 Alive She Knew Her shows us how his mission lives on in the continued fight for voting rights. We're marching today to dramatize to the nation. Long before joining the halls of Congress, John Lewis was on the front lines combating voter suppression. Selma, people could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. Only 2.1% of blacks were registered to vote. The Alabama native was attacked by state troopers during the 1965 march from Selma to Montgomery during what became known as Bloody Sunday. The images from that day paved the way for President Lyndon Johnson to sign the Voting Rights Act into law. 
the CEO of the New Georgia Project, a nonpartisan voter registration group in Georgia, credits the congressman with that victory. He has laid the groundwork uh, for us to build the Georgia of our dreams uh, and to build the country of our dreams. But 55 years later, the fight for the right to vote is raging on. In 2013, the Supreme Court dismissed a provision of the Voting Rights Act requiring states like Georgia to get changes to polling locations approved. Just last month, Congressman Lewis wrote a letter to the U.S. Attorney General begging. The record is clear. A rampant war is being waged against minorities voting rights in my home state of Georgia and across the nation. I urge you to correct course and take action. Time is of the essence to preserve the integrity and promises of our democracy. However, Ufad says even though Congressman Lewis won't be here to help fight for access during the November elections, he prepared the next generation of leaders to build on his work. And the beauty of his leadership style is that it was, um, you know, he brought people in, that it was inclusive. And so there are a lot of us who see this as our mission, who see this as our work. If you believe in something, you should speak up and you should fight for it. Congressman Lewis's legacy is more than voting rights, it's leadership over many decades. He saw protests in March help change our nation, and now thousands across the country continue to march for black lives. Hope Ford spoke with two young leaders and activists about continuing to make good trouble. And one of them, the president of the Georgia NAACP, was among those who applied to take the congressman's spot on the November ballot. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! Congressman Lewis once said Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. helped shape him. But from age 15 on, Lewis would use his actions and his words to inspire, influence, and guide others. He's someone that, since I was a little girl, I just have always looked up to him. Hannah Geber Selassie is one of many activists continuing to lead protests in Atlanta. Here, just three weeks before Lewis died, she watched her idol go into the Gold Dome as they protested outside the Capitol. He was almost giving us his blessing. Just, I'll never forget that moment. When their protest moved inside, she had the chance to show Lewis her appreciation. Thank you, Representative John Lewis. Thank you. Not realizing it would be the last time she saw him. He fought until his final weeks. If it were not for them, I would not be here today. Many of us would not be here today. Um, you know, they fought so that we could exist. And as the memorial grows below civil rights leaders of the past, current president of the Georgia NAACP, Reverend James Woodall, remembers celebrating the icon's 80th birthday in February. He just simply walked around the room and he danced with a few people and, you know, he just had nothing but joy on his face and, and love in his heart. And that's really the man he was. He just simply was a humble servant. Lewis's pursuit of justice left a playbook for young leaders like 26-year-old Woodall. To stand up, to speak out, and to show up and show out in ways that we knew to be necessary. Lewis's death in this moment and during this movement is a mix of heartbreak and motivation. We do mourn, but we also recommit to doing justice, to loving mercy, to walking humbly, and to doing it in a way that lifts up all people. We know the words and we know them well. And young justice advocates say they'll honor Lewis by continuing to make good trouble. They brought us here, and now it's time for us to take it even further. Thank you, Representative John Lewis. Thank you. Your 11 Alive Storm Trackers tracking some of those very isolated downpours tonight. Some of them have been pretty strong, though, with some gusty winds, some frequent lightning. Right now, we're seeing things start to quiet down along 75, where we had some strong storms earlier from McDonough into Stockbridge towards Forest Park. Those are pretty much evaporating at this hour. We had a really strong storm that was right up here along 85, right before the 985 split. But that one, too, not raining as hard, but still have quite a bit of light associated with it so heads up there and here across the mountains of North Georgia just a smattering of showers here's one in Cherokee County uh, right along 575 a heavy downpour with some lightning associated with it and in Cedartown we have a downpour as well here and we're watching this cell in Bremen pretty much evaporate at this hour so just bear in mind anywhere you go tonight you could run into one of these heavy downpours until about 9 30 10 o'clock we'll start to see things quiet down and we have that risk for severe that's best across far north Georgia. We're going to have that risk again tomorrow. We'll talk more about that coming up.
The former Atlanta police officer charged with murdering an African-American man in the Wendy's parking lot on University Avenue is asking the district attorney be recruited, uh, recused from the case. Garrett Rawl fatally shot Rayshard Brooks on the night of June 12th while attempting to arrest him for DUI. He faces felony murder and 10 other charges in connection with that case. Late this afternoon, Rolf's attorneys filed a motion to have Fulton County DA Paul Howard, who is up for re-election, removed from the case, saying he is systematically seeking to deny Rolf fair trial. The motion also claims that DA Howard has a conflict of interest because he himself is being investigated by the GBI in relation to the case. Rolf is currently out on bond. Howard's office says it will wait until the motion is assigned to a judge before responding. Still ahead, pandemic financial help set to expire soon, but lawmakers are working on to help millions of worried workers. Eleven Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at Eleven Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to Eleven Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Senator David Perdue is proposing a $50 billion program to support schools that chose to reopen. It's called the School Act and would be part of the second round of stimulus. Schools who develop reopening plans could apply for a grant. It would also connect available health care professionals to support schools. It would create a database so that school systems can share ideas and it streamlines information for parents and public health officials. Senator Perdue says the goal is to give schools tools to more safely bring students back to the classroom. 
it's an incentive to do it the right way, according to the CDC. The, the, the factors are the qualification for the funding would be compliance with the CDC guidelines. Would the grant money, the federal money, be available for a school that was offering the option, as many as are, saying we are going to be open for those who feel comfortable, but we will also provide virtual learning for parents who do not? That's a great question, yes. In my opinion, it would be. Now, you know, some people would, would argue that's not, that wouldn't be appropriate. I would argue that's appropriate. I don't want this to look like a federal mandate because that's the last thing I want to do. I think that parent is the best to, to make that decision. Both of Senator Purdue's parents were educators, and he says that more has to be done to help schools navigate the pandemic. Lawmakers face a critical deadline. Millions of unemployed workers staring down the prospect of losing pandemic assistance by the end of the month. NBC's Jay Gray has a closer look at the situation. The House will be in order. Lawmakers now back in Washington after a summer recess, dealing with a national crisis that refuses to take a break. COVID-19 in many areas spreading out of control. The numbers staggering. Nationwide, close to 4 million cases and over 140,000 deaths. Six months to the day after the first positive test in the U.S. Still, President Trump continues to tout the response of his administration. We're doing very well in so many different ways, but unfortunately, uh, this is something that's very tough, but we're going to get it solved. Those on the front lines of the fight have a very different perspective. What we're going through, it's absolutely horrific. This is a critical situation. A situation that brings with it severe economic problems. The economy will only get worse, worse if we do not, if we do not continue to support uh, working families in our country, as we have done. Two months ago, pushed by Democrats, the House passed a $3 trillion relief plan ignored by the Senate. Which was Today, Republican yeah, leaders meeting with the president at the White House say they're working on their own bill. Kids in school, jobs, and health care could be the theme of the proposal. With a significantly smaller payout. We're going to make sure that we don't pay people more money to stay home than go to work. Even as doctors are urging millions to stay home right now. Well, we, we have seen those storms out there tonight. They have been dotting the landscape, few and far between. But there has been some heavy downpours associated with these very isolated showers and storms. We've had some on the south side. They're really just falling apart right now. We've had some on the north side working up 85. They're moving towards Sugar Hill right now, so you'll probably have some heavier downpours there from that very isolated storm. But these do have a tendency to rain themselves out and then you see another one pop up down the road. So we're looking at a pretty good cell right now, just south of Canton on 575 and over towards Cedartown as well. And along I-20, we're seeing these showers kind of peter out as well. So um, we're expecting to see after sunset, losing a lot of energy, we'll see things start to clear up once again, just like it has the last couple of nights after sunset. So we do have that threat for a marginal threat for severe, that level one threat in North Georgia yet this evening, although one once we get past sunset, that'll probably be dropped. Looking out at sunset, it is gorgeous here in Gwinnett, and you can see some of those cloud buildups in the distance. It almost looks like a painting. It's so beautiful. And tomorrow, once again, the same pattern, hot, humid, heat of the day storms. Best chance is where the moisture is deepest for severe storms will be right up along the Tennessee line there. Damaging wind, lightning, and hail are going to be the main risks tomorrow as well. Look at these temps from today. 102 in Athens, 99 in Rome. 99 in Eatonton. It is indeed hot, and we are even hotter than that when you factor in the humidity in terms of the feels like temperature. And this hot pattern is going to be lingering through much of this week, although temperatures will back off just a tiny bit each day as that ridge of high pressure shifts to the east a little bit. Another place that we are watching is the tropics as far as development goes. You just saw that 10% for that system we've been watching off the Houston coastline here, off the Galveston coast in southeast Texas. So it's not looking very likely to develop into anything tropical, but we do have this system that's going to be moving north of Cuba through the Florida Straits. That has a 20% chance of developing the next two days, but a 30% chance the next five days. And guess what? It's making its way towards the Texas coast as well. So we'll have to watch that one carefully. And out way in the middle of the Atlantic, we have another disturbance that is out as a fish system right now, but it hasn't developed 
And it only has a 20% chance the next five days of developing. But we'll keep an eye on it as things can change in the tropics very quickly. So as far as what you can expect around here tonight, we'll likely see things quiet down the next couple of hours, and it'll be a quiet start to the day. Once you get into tomorrow, after lunchtime, that's when you'll start to see things pop very, very quickly. And that will happen probably between around 1 and 2 o'clock. We'll see some heavy downpours, Blairsville, into Canton, likely in the mountains. That's where we're expecting to see the heaviest of the activity. But we could see a severe thunderstorm pop up just about anywhere as these isolated storms develop during the day. And then on Wednesday, again, a few clouds to start. And then during the afternoon, it looks like we could see some heavy downpours, possibly a little bit more coverage on Wednesday just because we're going to see an increase in that low-level moisture, and that will help provide the fuel for more thunderstorm activity. So 40% chance as we head into t uh, tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, so every day during this week, 30% chance over the weekend. Temperatures don't change much. They back off a smidgen, but it is still unseasonably warm, and this pattern holds through the beginning of next week. The charts on the Department of Public Health's website are supposed to help make sense of the coronavirus pandemic. Instead, people tell us it's raising even more questions. Our investigators are taking your questions now to DPH themselves to get you answers. We touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched. Today we saw a bit of a break in the number of new COVID-19 cases. Here's what we know. The Department of Public Health reported about 2,400 new infections. Every day the state releases information about COVID-19, but there is a series of charts posted on their website that continue to raise questions and frustration. Here's investigator Rebecca Lindstrom to take your questions to DPH for answers. 
Each day, the Department of Public Health creates these graphs and uses colors to try to give people a better understanding of what's happening in their community. For example, the map on the right is from today. The one on the left is from three weeks ago. They look exactly the same, even though we've had about 66,000 new cases. Kate wrote us asking about the logic, why the visual would not communicate the rising issues. The visual map is important for people who may not understand the other charts and numbers. Someone else noted the same thing on Twitter, this time with the map that shows the impact on counties based off their population size. They again noted a rise in cases, but no change in the maps. The reason the colors don't change is because DPH keeps bumping up the numbers needed to be in the red or dark blue. Look again. This morning, a county needed at least 9,732 cases to be shaded in red. On June 29th, that color represented any county with more than 5,469 cases. If the benchmark from the 29th were still being used today, Cobb County would be red instead of dark blue, and Chatham, Clayton, and Muskogee would join Hall County in the second highest tier. Which is why Pam wrote us saying, it appears like they're trying to hide the fact that our numbers are increasing. DPH insists that is not the case. Their data team argues we're missing the point of the maps. They say the colors are just there to differentiate between those areas most affected. If the state set a fixed scale, they argue, eventually the counts and rates will all work their way to a single color at the top end of the data range in the last bucket. Bottom line, the data ranges are going to keep changing, but the color in your county may not. The data and the graphics are only as good as our understanding of what they're trying to represent. And that's why we always welcome your questions. What would you do if this was your neighborhood every night and you're getting ready to go to bed? Well, those in Castleberry Hill say this is not so good. They want some answers and action. That's still ahead on Prime Time. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. A smile from ear to ear. That's how staffers described the late Congressman John Lewis when he was presented with a unique portrait of himself. The inspiration for the painting came after portrait artist Carl Hess watched the movie Selma, which depicts the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Bloody Sunday. Part of the portrait is a young John Lewis over an image of him with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The other half is an older John Lewis over an image of him walking arm in arm with the Obamas. Hess said he wanted to connect who Lewis was earlier in his life with who he was later in his relationship with two great leaders. In your 20s, you're linked arms with Martin Luther King, the greatest uh, civil rights leader uh, to date. And in your later years, you're linked arms again with Michelle and Barack Obama. Hess received this letter of appreciation from Lewis after the painting was left for him on his desk last month and he posted it on his Instagram account. The portrait was supposed to be presented to Lewis at his birthday party this year, but those plans were uh, canceled because of COVID-19. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Georgia is in an impossible position, trying to fill the political seat of John Lewis as we remember the life of civil rights icon. He spent his entire adult life fighting for justice and equality. Lewis had the courage to risk his own life to promote change from lunch counter sit-ins as a teenager to joining the Freedom Rides. He was often brutally beaten. He was the youngest and last surviving speaker from 1963's March on Washington. Even after years of fighting in the movement and then decades as a lawmaker, he never stopped. He would go on to spend 33 years serving Georgia's 5th District until the day he died. Congressman Lewis, he never wavered. One piece of legislation took him 15 years to pass. And Joe Henke has a look at the vote Lewis called perhaps the most important of his or any other representative's careers. Representative John Lewis spent nearly half of his years in Washington fighting to build a museum for African American history. And when it finally opened, he told us he found himself fighting once again, but that time to hold back tears. Representative John Lewis began pushing for the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 1988. For 15 years, he introduced a bill to build the museum, but continuously faced opposition. Very hard, very difficult, almost impossible for us to get it through the Senate because of one senator by the name of Jesse Him from the state of North Carolina. He did not want to see an African American museum on the mall, I insist that it must be on the mall. I call the mall the front porch of America. It should be near the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument. Lewis's bill finally passed in 2003, but it took another 13 years to see the museum open. He called the 2016 opening a dream come true. We must tell the story, the whole story, 400 years story of African American contribution to this nation's history from slavery to the present without anger or apology. The bill behind this museum, perhaps the most important bill to Lewis that he authored, but he called the 2010 Affordable Health Care Act vote a defining moment. This may be the most important vote that we cast as members of this body. We have a moral obligation today, tonight, to make health care a right and not a privilege. Today, Georgia Democrats named an Atlanta state senator to replace the late Congressman Lewis on the November election ballot. Nakima Williams will be on the ballot facing a Republican reality show star in November. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more on Williams and how we got here. The vote by the Georgia Democratic Executive Committee, which it did in public on a Zoom call, makes Nakima Williams the automatic favorite to win the 5th Congressional District seat in one of the most Democratic districts in the country. I've considered myself a student of the John Lewis School of Politics. Nakima Williams quickly became the front runner as the Democratic Party of Georgia solicited applications over the weekend from anybody who wanted to succeed Lewis. Morehouse College President Emeritus Robert Franklin was one of them. We are all sons and daughters of John uh, Lewis. Although Lewis died July 17th, his name is still on the ballot in the November election facing a reality show star, Republican Angela Stanton King. 
By Sunday's deadline, the state party had 131 online applications to become the Democrats' replacement for Lewis. The party's nominating committee, which included Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and former candidates for Governor Stacey Abrams and Jason Carter, narrowed down the list to five finalists by late morning today. The finalists were Senator Williams, State Representative Park Cannon, Atlanta City Councilman Andre Dickens, Robert Franklin, and James Major Woodall, president of the Georgia NAACP. I would become the first openly queer woman member of Congress. Representative Cannon finished a distant second in the voting. Williams' support came from her presence as chair of the state Democratic Party, bolstered by her arrest at the state capitol in 2018 during a protest that echoed the civil rights arrests of Congressman Lewis. He showed me the value of putting myself, sometimes physically, in between the dangerous policies that the most vulnerable communities are hurt by. The Democrats were on a tight deadline. They had to formally submit Williams' nomination at the state capitol by 4.30 p.m., and they took the vote with about two hours to spare. Ever since he passed away, people have been gathering at the 55-foot mural on Auburn Avenue, remembering the congressman. It really reflects his reputation as a civil rights giant, yet throughout the years, he continued to remind people you don't have to be a giant to make change. We asked Atlantans about what his message meant to them. We grew up in Atlanta, born and raised at Grady. Um, John Lewis meant a lot to the community, and he meant a lot to me. Because just growing up, uh, knowing what he sacrificed. I think it is just um, of importance to educate, especially our younger generations, to know the importance of this man that passed away and his legacy. The things that they did paved the way for people of color like me to enjoy what we are enjoying now. I never actually met okay, uh, John Lewis, but I did attend a program where he spoke and just left a great impact on my life with his memories, a lot of the things he had to endure. John Lewis had to stand up, he did, and I feel like that's what we need to do now, is we need to show up to show other people that we are here for them. It's our calling to continue to do his work and to continue to fight injustice and to um, raise our voices. We continue to remember Congressman Lewis throughout tonight's shows. Coming up in the next half hour, his legacy of leadership and how he has inspired another generation of young people all over the world to fight for education, representation, and equality. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. You see my phone here in the screen. That's uh, because it's propped up because I'm doing a Facebook Live. We have about 300 people on Facebook Live right now. A lot of folks are commenting on just how hot it is. In fact, we have uh, Dora saying caliente. I think that describes it very well. And Angela McCain saying, hey, Chris, it sure was a hot one today. Yeah, we got up to... 95 degrees today and with the heat index it felt like it was in the lower 100s and with that heat and humidity we are seeing just a few showers most places tonight are dry but we have a couple of areas where you can see some isolated showers that are developing and those spots that have those isolated showers are also experiencing a little bit of lightning out there too so let me put this into motion they're not moving that much they're just kind of developing bubbling up and raining themselves out drifting up to the north just a little bit here in atlanta we're fine now we had some showers on the west side earlier. Those have fallen apart. Here's one up in Gwinnett County. Actually, two showers here. One around Lawrenceville that has some thunder with it. This one that's getting up closer to Sugar Hill and toward the Suwannee area. It's weakening. Still some moderate rain with that, but it's weakening some. Up in uh, near Canton and Cherokee County, that one is developing with some thunder and lightning. Also in Polk County near Cedartown, we have a little bit of thunder and lightning with that. But as you can see, they're very small in size but they do have some heavy rain in association with them. On the south side, not a lot happening here, so just a few showers over in Carroll County. Take a look at this on the bigger picture, and you can see this is our live look from our tower cam in Rome as the sun has gone down, but we're looking toward the west, and you can see some light on the horizon with dry weather conditions up in Rome at this hour. Stay with us. We're going to talk about whether or not we're going to see more rain moving in and if we could potentially see a break in all this heat and humidity. More on that coming up in just a few minutes. So neighbors in Castleberry Hill, they're pretty fed up. They say late night drag racing, large crowds and even guns are leaving them in fear. 11 Alive, Chanu Hur, talk to some of those people who live out there. He joining us live tonight. Chanu, have they actually brought in police and given them, given them a call? 
Well, yeah, some of these neighbors have. They say that this happened yesterday night as well as on Saturday, but right now, you can still see all these tire marks right here in the street at the intersection of Peter Street and Fair Street. The bulk of those tire marks right here in the middle of the intersection. Now, neighbors have reached out to us for several weeks about this. Atlanta police say they responded Saturday night around 1030. And when police showed up right here, a big crowd dispersed. One driver was issued a citation from APD and state police handled a number of drivers of ATVs and a dirt bike. Neighbors in Castleberry Hill say they're tired of this late night, loud drag racing. Callie McConnell and her boyfriend George Boone live near the intersection of Peter Street and Fair Street. They say the drag racing has been going on for weeks. On Saturday, they saw and heard it outside their home. And it saw uh, a bunch of cars starting to pull up and starting to rev their engines and do burnouts on their, of their tires. She took this video showing a car doing donuts in the street surrounded by a huge crowd. This lasted for probably 45 minutes to an hour directly in front of where we live. Atlanta police say when they got on the scene, the crowd of people and cars scattered. Officers stopped multiple cars, one dirt bike and seven ATVs. APD cited one driver. Georgia State Police handled the rest. But neighbor Jacob Burkhardt says it was the same scene Sunday night in the same place. Another man who lives in that area sent us these videos he says he took Sunday night. They back up what Burkhardt describes. Burnouts, uh, commercial grade fireworks like those mortar shells. Um, that were going, you know, within feet of people's homes. Burkhardt says he called Atlanta police. In the same video taken by a man Sunday night, you can see police later blocking off the street. These neighbors are desperately asking for help, not wanting things to escalate. You saw people on the streets with guns, and you don't know what they're going to do. They could start shooting into our homes. There's just a lot of potential for things to go wrong. It wouldn't take much for something really bad to happen. <laughs> Now, APD tells us they do understand the frustration of the neighbors out here, and they say they will continue to monitor and work out in this neighborhood. All right, thanks, Chinu. Moving on now to school reopening. It has been the biggest topic of the past few weeks. Another school district walking back its plans to reopen as COVID-19 cases hit a new record high over the weekend. Gwinnett County Public Schools now going fully digital for at least the first several weeks of the upcoming school year. Originally, families were given the option there to go in person or online learning. Still, educators in the county gathered for a rally this morning saying there is a lot the district needs to address before classes start. Teachers say they want the option of working from home or from the classroom, and some say the digital divide is still a problem for many kids in the district. Elwin Lopez walks us through it. There was inequity in education even before the pandemic. Now with online learning, there's growing concern some might fall behind even further. Access to a computer and internet seem nearly essential as COVID-19 continues to close classroom doors, shifting learning from a pencil to a click. But access has proven to be a challenge for many Hispanic and African American students. I feel like this is just another variable, another layer added that helps widen that gap. And then some of our kids might not ever get out of that. And that definitely worries me. Nudie Castillo Crawford is an academic director at Gwinnett County Public Schools. She also leads the district's Hispanic mentorship program. I think all of us just want what's best for our kids. A survey by Somos found in April that amid the pandemic, nearly 40% of Latinos did not have broadband internet access at home and 32% did not have a computer. The divide is felt in Gwinnett County, where Hispanic and Latino students make up 32% of the district, compared to 21% who identify as Caucasian. And I had parents tell me, you know, we walked with a Chromebook to McDonald's and we sat outside in the parking lot, you know, not even in a car. And she was like, we sat outside with my two kids and we did, they did their work outside in the parking lot at McDonald's. As Gwinnett prepares for its public schools to start virtually, Castillo says the school district will provide hotspots and laptops to those in need, but there is still some concern for households with more than one student. You know, there's families that they have a elementary, middle school and high school kids 
and they cannot provide laptops. Probably they have one laptop for the whole entire family. Some educators also told me that another challenge that some parents faced when trying to gain internet access was that some of these companies were asking parents to provide their social security numbers. And while many immigrants don't even have one, others just didn't feel comfortable providing one. So we know things have changed a lot for school districts over the past few weeks. So we have a full breakdown of what parents need to know district by district. Find our story on 11alive.com or on the 11alive app. Still ahead, with so many districts going online in the fall, parents are forming learning pods, small groups of kids who have a privately hired teacher. But there are concerns this is just widening the education gap. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. More 11 Alive news in prime time coming up after the break. Yes to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear, on 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, With memories and praise pouring from all over the world for Congressman Lewis, we spoke with a Southwest Atlanta woman who has some very unique memories of John Lewis. Here's Jennifer Bellamy. And I realized what we did and what we went through and the danger that we were in. Very few of us remember Congressman John Lewis like Alice Thomas Moore. Memories like joining Lewis's Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC movement in 1965 a foot soldier at only 16 and fighting for her parents' right to vote. Uh, yeah, he was very energetic and uh, I, back then, I was 16 years old and he was in his 20s and uh, we just thought he was just fantastic. He, he was very, uh, very outspoken and uh, very forceful and, and very determined to do uh, what we needed to do and to teach us to do what we needed to do and he was teaching us the uh, nonviolent way of marching and protesting. And Alice joined Lewis in the basement of the now famous Brown Chapel AME Church in Selma, taking in his every word. And she had to. Alice was arrested three times, even spending some time in a prison camp as a teenager. It just gave me more determination to go back for the next, uh, the next trial. That next trial came quicker than she thought. Alice joined Lewis on the march now known as Bloody Sunday. She braved the threat of tear gas and violence and even saw Lewis on the ground, bloody and beaten. An image she remembers as if it were yesterday, 55 years later. I can still, I can still see him bloody at that one point that I did see him, yes. But she says Lewis never wavered from his mission, voting rights for all. It was kind of profound and, and exciting that you knew somebody of that magnitude that had worked so hard and done the things that he had done and fighting for the things that he had taught me to fight for because he helped teach me what to fight for because I knew what I wanted for my parents to vote and I knew that's what I was fighting for. And Alice got just what she marched for. That August, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, her parents registered to vote. That my father, I was just so happy because he, the main one that, you know, he got to 
vote before he left this world. You know, he got to vote. Alice Thomas Moore also told us she has a new mission. She wants to see the bridge renamed after Congressman Lewis, and she said name the day and she'll be there fighting for it. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Tracker, still talking with now uh, about 160, 175 people on Facebook Live. A lot of folks are asking about the um, uh, the hot air out there, when we're going to get some rain. And I was just telling them about a new, what is called a significant weather advisory that was just issued for folks in Polk County with a thunderstorm that's moving through there. I'm going to take you in a little bit closer to that in just a second. As you can see around North Georgia, not a lot of places getting rain. There are just a, a few spots where we're seeing some of those showers that are strong enough to give us some thunder and lightning. Here in Atlanta, we're fine. We had some showers on the west side earlier. They have rained themselves out. We've been watching some of these cells here in Gwinnett County. This one near Suwannee and Sugar Hill, it's falling apart. It's raining itself out. This one was a little bit heavier from Lawrenceville, stretching on up toward uh, near the Mall of Georgia area. It still has a couple of lightning strikes with it. It's it's starting to show signs of weakening. And then this one over in Cherokee Co County near Canton, between Canton and Woodstock, right there at 575. It has some pockets of heavy rain with it and also uh, some thunder and lightning there too. This is the one in Cedar Town in Polk County nearing the South Floyd County line uh, where we have 40 mile an hour winds and heavy rain and lightning. Now, as you can see, it's kind of small, not impacting a lot of people, but where it is raining hard, you've got 11 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes, just in that really small cell. So this one's pretty powerful. And again, I mentioned those 40 mile an hour winds in association with it. On the south side, not a lot of action going on. A few showers falling apart over in Carroll County as well. All right, take a live look. All right, this is our tower cam in Rome. I know that that's going to look a little bit dark there, but right when I took that, I don't know if you noticed it, we had a little bit of a lightning flash. And what I've done here is I have moved our camera around to uh, in Rome to look toward the south where you can see some of those darker clouds. Oh, there's, there's another little bit of a lightning flash too. So I, I wanted to point the camera in that direction so you could see some of that lightning. This is looking toward South Floyd County, the northern parts of Polk County, where I showed you that storm that had the thunder and lightning with it. And every once in a while, there you see just another little flash uh, that's going on right there, but nothing in downtown Rome. Now, I really don't think these storms that we're having out there tonight are going to be severe. The Storm Prediction Center is still holding on to a marginal risk in far north Georgia for tonight. That would be really only a few isolated shadows. Hours. I really think that most of those have all died out. And then tomorrow, another marginal risk for far north Georgia. That's the level one out of five risk for a few isolated storms that could have some damaging wind, lightning or hail. But we're not expecting any you know, widespread severe weather during the day tomorrow. We're all still really hot. 85 right now. That's 10 degrees lower than our high today. We got up to 95 for a high today. So right now we're 85. Athens is still 88. Rome is still 88. We still have a heat index. Dew points are in the 60s, upper 60s, and it still makes it feel hotter than the actual temperature. In Athens, you still feel like 92. Rome, you still feel like 95 degrees when you factor in that heat and humidity. Your body's working harder to cool itself down. Tomorrow, another hot day, 94 for a high. On our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, we're going to go with a 6, where we'll see a few of those scattered showers around. Rain chance up a little bit more to 40%. So here's a look in the morning. We're going to start off dry. At lunchtime, a few clouds build in, a couple of showers starting to develop in far north Georgia. And then in the afternoon tomorrow, 40% chance you'll see a couple of showers dying out in the evening. And then going into Wednesday, we're going to do the same thing, a dry start. And then in the afternoon, about that 40% chance for some of those scattered showers that will be moving through the area. So here's a look at your seven-day outlook. We are going to see those rain chances that are going to hold at about 40% over the next few days. Um, and then we go down for the weekend to about a 30% chance for some showers that will move on through on Friday and Saturday. Notice the temperatures that are going to come down a little bit too. We'll be in the mid 90s tomorrow, Wednesday 93, Thursday 92, lower 90s Friday and Saturday, and then for the weekend just that 30% chance for a shower. Then back to a 40% chance on Monday with temperatures that will pretty much in the afternoons hold in the lower 90s getting into the beginning of next week. Today we learned the funeral plans for another civil rights icon, Reverend C.T. Vivian, who died the same day as Congressman Lewis. 
Vivian was an early key advisor to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He participated in the Freedom Rides and in 2013 was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. For years, he and his son Al worked to encourage diversity in the workplace and dispel myths about race and equality here in Atlanta. His funeral is going to be small and private because of COVID-19. It is scheduled for 11 a.m. Thursday at Providence Missionary Baptist Church here in Atlanta. gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed. To Many major school districts have announced they will be fully virtual in the fall, and now parents are scrambling to figure out what's that going to look like? One solution to form pods. That's what four or five other kids in the same grade and one adult can facilitate the virtual learning. But as Caitlin Ross reports, there are concerns now. It could create an even bigger gap among students based on what families can really afford to pay. Every single parent wants the best education for their child, but so many families are now left feeling like there are no good options now that all of the learning will be virtual. If parents have to return to work, who can supervise their kid and make sure they get the best education? No one has ever been in this situation. School districts, we've never seen this pandemic before. Ty Lewis is an educator and runs Educationally Speaking, a tutoring program for children. And even she's worried about what school will look like once her husband returns to work in person. We have two young children, and sometimes my mom is up here and she has dementia, so she's high risk. She says the COVID-19 pandemic has turned education on its head. And now more than ever, families need to lean on each other to get through. A popular idea has been creating these learning pods for kids in the same grade. So when you're forming these villages, you're actually able to pull the resources from, again, educators and other parents. She says most groups are forming online through Facebook and community organizers, but she's worried there will be inequity based on who is able to pay for something like that and who can't. Katie Whittlesley runs the nonprofit Education Cures and Homeschool Resource Academics Plus. She's worried about the same things. I've been fearful for our children. I mean, just absolutely terrified that there are so many, there's already a discrepancy. She says parents will have to advocate for their kids now that school will be online. We all have the power to make a difference in the life of one child, 
And it doesn't matter if you are a teacher or you're just a mom who cares. I think that this is the time to really jump in and help someone else. And a lot of parents are finding these groups through local parenting sites on Facebook or their community websites. Usually someone will offer to host four or five children and then they'll supervise that learning online. Go ahead, not only did he fight for equality, without him, traffic could be even worse in Atlanta. How Congressman John Lewis was involved in one of the biggest freeway battles. Had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. While many of us know Congressman John Lewis for his fight for civil rights, did you know he was also part of what became the largest freeway revolt in the city's history. This goes back to before John Lewis became a congressman when he was serving on Atlanta City Council. There were several different freeway plans they were talking about inside what's now I-285. One would have added an eight to 10 lane freeway running from the current south end of Georgia 400 southward to connect with I-675 to the south of Atlanta. Lewis opposed it. He helped broker an alternative use for the space which turned into Freedom Parkway opening in the 90s before the Olympics with the green space and what later became the Carter Center. Later, Freedom Parkway was named after Lewis in 2018. Congressman Lewis really made it his life's work to fight voter suppression and ensure representation for all Americans. 11 Alive, Chanu Her shows us how his mission lives on in the continued fight for voting rights. We're marching today to dramatize to the nation Long before joining the halls of Congress, John Lewis was on the front lines combating voter suppression. In Selma, people could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. Only 2.1% of 
of blacks are registered to vote. The Alabama native was attacked by state troopers during the 1965 march from Selma to Montgomery during what became known as Bloody Sunday. The images from that day paved the way for President Lyndon Johnson to sign the Voting Rights Act into law. The CEO of the New Georgia Project, a nonpartisan voter registration group in Georgia, credits the congressman with that victory. He has laid the groundwork uh, for us to build the Georgia of our dreams uh, and to build the country of our dreams. But 55 years later, the fight for the right to vote is raging on. In 2013, the Supreme Court dismissed a provision of the Voting Rights Act requiring states like Georgia to get changes to polling locations approved. Just last month, Congressman Lewis wrote a letter to the U.S. Attorney General begging. The record is clear. A rampant war is being waged against minorities' voting rights in my home state of Georgia and across the nation. I urge you to correct course and take action. Time is of the essence to preserve the integrity and promises of our democracy. However, Ufad says even though Congressman Lewis won't be here to help fight for access during the November elections, he prepared the next generation of leaders to build on his work. And the beauty of his leadership style is that it was, um, you know, he brought people in, that it was inclusive. And so there are a lot of us who see this as our mission, who see this as our work. If you believe in something, you should speak up and you should fight for it. Congressman Lewis's legacy is more than voting rights. It's leadership over many decades. He saw protests and marches help change our country. And now thousands across the country continue to march for black lives. Hope for talked to two young leaders and activists about continuing to grow and to make good trouble. And one of them, the president of the Georgia NAACP, was among those who applied to take his spot on the November ballot. I can't breathe! Congressman Lewis once said Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. helped shape him. But from age 15 on, Lewis would use his actions and his words to inspire, influence, and guide others. He's someone that, since I was a little girl, I just have always looked up to him. Hannah Gebrselassi is one of many activists continuing to lead protests in Atlanta. Here, just three weeks before Lewis died, she watched her idol go into the Gold Dome as they protested outside the Capitol. He was almost giving us his blessing. Just, I'll never forget that moment. When their protest moved inside, she had the chance to show Lewis her appreciation. Thank you, Representative John Lewis. Thank you. Not realizing it would be the last time she saw him. He fought until his final weeks. If it were not for them, I would not be here today. Many of us would not be here today. Um, you know, they fought so that we could exist. And as the memorial grows below civil rights leaders of the past, current president of the Georgia NAACP, Reverend James Woodall, remembers celebrating the icon's 80th birthday in February. He just simply walked around the room and he danced with a few people and, you know, he just had nothing but joy on his face and, and love in his heart. And that's really the man he was. He just simply was a humble servant. Lewis's pursuit of justice left a playbook for young leaders like 26-year-old Woodall. To stand up, to speak out, and to show up and show out in ways that we knew to be necessary. Lewis's death in this moment and during this movement is a mix of heartbreak and motivation. We do mourn, but we also recommit to doing justice, to loving mercy, to walking humbly, and to doing it in a way that lifts up all people. We know the words and we know them well. And young justice advocates say they'll honor Lewis by continuing to make good trouble. They brought us here, and now it's time for us to take it even further. Thank you, Representative John Lewis. Thank you. We continue to watch a few isolated showers out there that uh, have some heavy rain and thunder and lightning at this late night hour. They're still holding together pretty well. Here in Atlanta, we are fine at this hour. I'm going to put this into motion. You can see not a lot of rain out there, but there are just a few of those isolated cells. I want to start off with this one up around Gwinnett County. This had some lightning with it right there at the Mall of Georgia. On my Facebook Live a little while ago, a few people mentioned that it was just like the bottom fell out at the Mall of Georgia where we have this heavy rain that's coming through. There is some lightning there. 
there. Also, as you go up toward the south end of Lake Lanier near Sugar Hill and Buford, a few showers there. This is up in Canton. This is up 575 between Holly Springs and Canton. We have some heavy rain with some thunder and lightning there. That is beginning to show some signs of weakening. Right now, we have about five lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. And then over to the west, this is in southern Floyd County and the northern parts of Polk County really heavy rain here and then also at Cave Spring and this has a lot of lightning with it. We have about 19 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. They're not really moving that much. They just kind of bubble up with the heat and humidity and are drifting maybe toward the north, but they're pretty much just waiting uh, to rain themselves out and then elsewhere around North Georgia. Not much else is going on. Take a live look out there right now. This is our tower cam uh, out at Truist Park as we're looking over live over the ballpark there. You can even see the lights on at the ballpark right now, but we're looking toward Toward the west, and I know this is kind of a dark night sky. As I've been watching this over the past few minutes, you can see some of that lightning from the distance to the west there over into parts of Polk County and even into the southern parts of Floyd County as well. Every once in a while, we'll see a little lightning flash in that dark sky. When it's night outside, you can see lightning from really far away, those, uh, those flashes. Stay with us. Uh, we'll let you know whether or not we're going to have another hot and humid day tomorrow and if we'll see any additional showers and storms developing. The former Atlanta police officer charged with murdering a black man in a Wendy's parking lot is asking the district attorney to be recused from the case. Garrett Roth fatally shot Rayshard Brooks on the night of June 12th while attempting to arrest him for DUI. He faces felony murder and 10 other charges in that case. Late this afternoon, Roth's attorneys filed a motion to have Fulton County DA Paul Howard removed from the case, saying he is uh, uh, systematically, that is, excuse me, seeking to deny Rolf a fair trial. The motion also claims Howard has a conflict of interest because he is being investigated by the GBI in relation to this case. Rolf is currently out on bond. Howard's office says it will wait until the motion is assigned to a judge before responding. Senator David Perdue of Georgia is proposing a $50 billion program to support schools that choose to reopen. It's called the School Act and would be part of the second round of stimulus. Schools that develop reopening plans could apply for a grant. It would also connect available health care professionals to support schools. It would also create a database so school systems can share ideas and streamlines information for parents and public health officials. Senator Perdue says the goal is to give schools tools to more safely bring students back to the classroom. It's an incentive to do it the right way. According to the CDC, the, the, the factors are the qualification for the funding would be compliance with the CDC guidelines. Would the grant money, the federal money, be available for a school that was offering the option, as many are saying, we are going to be open for those who feel comfortable, but we will also provide virtual learning for parents who do not? That's a great question, yes. In my opinion, it would be. Now, you know, some people would, would argue that's not, that wouldn't be appropriate. I would argue that's appropriate. I don't want this to look like a federal mandate because that's the last thing I want to do. I think that parent is the best to, to make that decision. Both of Senator Purdue's parents were educators. He says more has to be done to help schools navigate the pandemic. Lawmakers face a critical deadline. Millions of unemployed workers facing the prospect of losing pandemic assistance by the end of the month. NBC's Jay Gray has a closer look. The House will be in order. Lawmakers now back in Washington after a summer recess, dealing with a national crisis that refuses to take a break. COVID-19 in many areas spreading out of control. The numbers staggering. Nationwide, close to 4 million cases and over 140,000 deaths. Six months to the day after the first positive test in the U.S. Still, President Trump continues to tout the response of his administration. We're doing very well in so many different ways, but unfortunately, uh, this is something that's very tough, but we're going to get it solved. Those on the front lines of the fight have a very different perspective. What we're going through, it's absolutely horrific. This is a critical situation. A situation that brings with it severe economic problems. The economy will only get worse, worse if we do not if we do not continue to support uh, working families in our country, as we have done. Two months ago, pushed by Democrats, the House passed a $3 trillion relief plan ignored by the Senate. Rich, please. Today, Republican yeah, leaders meeting with the president at the White House say they're working on their own bill. Kids in school, jobs, and health care could be the theme of the proposal. With a significantly smaller payout. 
We're going to make sure that we don't pay people more money to stay home than go to work. Even as doctors are urging millions to stay home right now. The charts on the Department of Public Health's website are supposed to help you make sense of the coronavirus pandemic. Instead, people tell us it's raising even more questions. Our investigators are taking your questions to DPH to get you answers. Off or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your car. Today, we saw a bit of a break in the number of new COVID-19 cases. The Department of Public Health reported about 2,400 new infections every day. The state releases a lot of information about COVID-19, but there's a series of charts posted on their website that continue to raise questions and frustration. Investigator Rebecca Lindstrom takes your questions to DPH for answers. Each day, the Department of Public Health creates these graphs and uses colors to try to give people a better understanding of what's happening in their community. For example, the map on the right is from today. The one on the left is from three weeks ago. They look exactly the same, even though we've had about 66,000 new cases. Kate wrote us asking about the logic, why the visual would not communicate the rising issues. The visual map is important for people who may not understand the other charts and numbers. Someone else noted the same thing on Twitter, this time with the map that shows the impact on counties based off their population size. They again noted a rise in cases, but no change in the maps. The reason the colors don't change is because DPH 
keeps bumping up the numbers needed to be in the red or dark blue. Look again. This morning, a county needed at least 9,732 cases to be shaded in red. On June 29th, that color represented any county with more than 5,469 cases. If the benchmark from the 29th were still being used today, Cobb County would be red instead of dark blue, and Chatham, Clayton, and Muskogee would join Hall County in the second highest tier. Which is why Pam wrote us saying, it appears like they're trying to hide the fact that our numbers are increasing. DPH insists that is not the case. Their data team argues we're missing the point of the maps. They say the colors are just there to differentiate between those areas most affected. If the state set a fixed scale, they argue, eventually the counts and rates will all work their way to a single color at the top end of the data range in the last bucket. Bottom line, the data ranges are going to keep changing, but the color in your county may not. The data and the graphics are only as good as our understanding of what they're trying to represent. And that's why we always welcome your questions. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. I'm resetting the tower cam here. I want to give you guys a better view when I pop it up here in just a minute as we're looking toward the south and west as we're looking for a little bit of a lightning that we can see in the distance from our tower cam. You can see what we're watching right there south of Rome where we have some pretty good showers right on the Floyd and Polk County line that has some heavy rain with it. We have some additional showers up in Cherokee County, up in Hall and Gwinnett counties. But let me take you into this one first because this is the one that has the heaviest rain with it and most of the lightning. This is Rome. Here's Lindale. It's between Lindale and Cedartown where we have this heavy rain. You may be seeing lightning from a distance over in West Georgia or maybe even hearing some of that thunder. The rain isn't really impacting a lot of people, but we do have about 13 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes right there on the Floyd and Polk County line. Up in Cherokee County between Canton and Holly Springs, this cell is finally raining itself out a little bit, but we still have a few lightning strikes with that. We have about three lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. This over near Latham Town uh, is also having some more moderate rain with it. We're not detecting any lightning with that right now. And then we have some lightning left with this on the south end of Lake Lanier. This is right on the Forsyth County line. As you get closer to 400 there between Cumming and Lake Lanier, we have this cell that was over Sugar Hill and Buford earlier. It's just kind of drifting up toward the north. It is showing some signs of weakening as well. And you can see that motion here. Not a lot of movement with it. They just kind of develop and then rain themselves out at the same time. These are drifting northward just a little bit. I'm going to widen out a little more. Nothing else over North Georgia, over to the east of us or south. A couple of showers in Carroll County. Those are very light. I don't think those are going to get much uh, stronger either. Take a live look out there right now. This is our tower cam in Floyd County. So I've moved the camera to be looking more toward uh, the south and west. And I know the sky's kind of dark. You can see the flags here and the wind blowing. All right, did you see that? So I was keeping an eye on this tower cam because every once in a while we can see some of that lightning from the distance as we're looking southward toward the Polk County line. There was just another one there, just really just some of those white flashes that we see in the sky there from that lightning that's coming from a distance. Now in our weather headlines, it was hot out there today. We got up to 95. It felt like the lower 100s with the heat index. It's going to be hot again tomorrow. We'll have some scattered afternoon showers developing with the rain chance at about 40%. And then we'll see some slightly lower temperatures next week. Now, I'm not talking about cold or anything. We're just talking about going from the mid 90s to the lower 90s. Today we hit 95. Our average high for this time of year is 89. So we were six degrees below the average. It was a really mild start this morning. 77 to start the day. We picked up 700 of an inch of rain in Atlanta and that rainfall surplus is just under a foot above where we should be in rainfall for the year. We're going to see that 40% chance for rain again on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Temperatures Tuesday at 94 down in 93 Wednesday, 92 Thursday, 91 Friday. For the weekend, rain chance down just a little bit to 30%. Then we're back to 40% again on Monday with temperatures for Sunday and Monday. That'll be right around 91 degrees. We continue to hear promising news about the development of a vaccine to protect us against COVID-19. In 2009, researchers had a vaccine to guard against the swine flu in just five months. But why is it taking so much longer this time? Here's our why guy. It's called Operation Warp Speed. The United States government is pouring billions of dollars into an effort to develop a COVID-19 vaccine as quickly as possible. The hope is to have one available by the end of the year or early 2021. 
Eleven years ago, the country was in a similar rush, needing a vaccine to protect Americans from the swine flu. In that case, it took a little over five months. Let's look at why this effort is taking so much longer. The virus that swept the world in 2009 was a new strain of the flu. There was already a flu vaccine that scientists adjust each year. We had a base. We have an understanding of what we need to trigger in terms of an immune response. Vaccines work by imitating an infection, prompting your body's immune system to fight back. Scientists first need to learn what will prompt an immune response. While they had a head start with the swine flu, Dr. Walt Orenstein of Emory's Vaccine Center says that's not the case with COVID-19. We don't understand yet what is and what is not a protective immune response. We have suspicions, but we don't really have clear knowledge. COVID-19 is caused by a new strain of the coronavirus. It's not the first coronavirus, but the others never resulted in a vaccine. There were developing vaccines and but we never got to licensure and use. The first doses of the swine flu vaccine were given on October 5th, 2009, as the U.S. was experiencing a second wave of the virus. The World Health Organization declared an end to the pandemic the following August. If you have a question for Jerry Carnes, our Why Guy, send it to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email. It's to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect. A smile from ear to ear. That's how staffers describe the late Congressman John Lewis when he was presented with a unique portrait of himself. The inspiration from the painting came after portrait artist Carl Hess watched the movie Selma, which depicts the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Bloody Sunday. Hess said he wanted to connect who Lewis was then and now and his relationship with two great leaders. In your 20s, 
you are linked arms with Martin Luther King, the greatest uh, civil rights leader uh, to date. And in your later years, you're linked arms again with Michelle and Barack Obama. Hess received this letter of appreciation from Lewis after the painting was left for him on his desk last month. We're going to see those rain chances in the afternoons the next few days at about 40%. Still going to be hot, 94 for a high Tuesday, 93 Wednesday, lower 90s Thursday and Friday. Rain chance, it's still there for the weekend, but it comes down just a little bit to 30%. Then we're back to 40% again on Monday with high temperatures in the lower 90s. All right, stick around. Primetime rose on at 10, and we'll see you on Up Late at 11 Alive at 11. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. I ask that all members rise for a moment of silence in remembrance of the Honorable John Robert Lewis. Silence on Capitol Hill today. Members of Congress pausing to reflect on the life and times and legacy of Congressman John Lewis. Joining the tributes across the nation, a man who dedicated his entire life to fighting injustice, being kind, being decent, encouraging every American to do better wherever and whenever they were. Georgia's Democratic Party leaders grieving over the loss of Congressman Lewis. 
by law, they had to choose today a nominee to replace Representative Lewis on the November ballot. And they chose State Senator Nakima Williams, who is also the chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia. So who is Nakima Williams? Let's go to John Sherrick live at the Lewis Hero Mural in the heart of the 5th Congressional District. Lewis uh, really represented for 34 years, John. He did, and State Senator Nakima Williams considers John Lewis to be her personal and political hero and mentor. And now that Williams is the Democratic nominee in this heavily Democratic district, odds are likely she will win the seat in November. Let her go! Let her go! What would John Lewis do? Georgia State Senator Nakima Williams, a disciple of John Lewis, speaks with pride of that day in the Capitol Rotunda when state troopers arrested her and more than a dozen others during a peaceful voting rights demonstration one week after the November 2018 midterms. She very much is following in the tradition of Congressman Lewis. Emory University political science professor Dr. Andra Gillespie. Uh, to be a tireless advocate for women's rights and for voting rights. In many ways, she does represent a new generation of leadership. She's a Gen Xer. Nakima Williams and her husband, parents of a young son. Williams was born in Columbus, Georgia, grew up nearby in Alabama, became a special education teacher in Fulton County. Later, she was an executive with Planned Parenthood Southeast advocating pro-choice causes. She's now a union executive organizing domestic workers. And last year, Senator Williams was selected as the first ever black woman to chair the Democratic Party of Georgia. Congress Congressman Lewis was a personal hero. Williams has fought in the legislature for progressive and liberal causes. One of the leading advocates for um, repealing stand your ground laws in Georgia to rethink uh, immunity for police officers who are caught in misconduct. And Williams has taken a lead in her party's criticisms of President Trump and Governor Kemp and their responses to the pandemic. The Republican nominee for the seat is Angela Stanton King, and she is an outspoken supporter of the president and governor and conservative causes. And we are trying to reach her, Angela Stanton King, the GOP nominee for the 5th Congressional seat. And also we're trying to reach the GOP chairman in Georgia to get their reactions to Nakima Williams and also their opinions and reactions about what's going to happen in the upcoming campaign. And again, Atlanta has historically been a solidly Democratic congressional district there. It absolutely has. In fact, only one Republican has ever served in Congress from Atlanta since the end of the Civil War. His name was Fletcher Thompson. That was 50 years ago. So, as always, never, never count anyone out. But as history would be our guide and current politics would be our guide, it would seem that this seat and this election this year would be Nakima Williams to lose. All right. Thanks, John. We will keep a close eye on it on the road to November. 11 Alive is honoring the life and legacy of John Lewis in a primetime special. That's Wednesday at 9 p.m. over on 11 Alive. Family has not yet announced the memorial details for Congressman Lewis. However, today we did learn about the funeral plans for the Reverend C.T. Vivian. The 95-year-old died on Friday hours before Congressman Lewis. Dr. King once described him as the greatest preacher who ever lived, a key advisor in the movement to Dr. King. And his work in the SELC, the Freedom Riders in the 1960s in Nashville, in Atlanta, where he moved in 1975, all about equality and justice wherever he walked, wherever he went. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2013. A small private service will be held Thursday at Providence Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta. We have much more on the remarkable lives of both Congressman Lewis and the Reverend Vivian on 11alive.com. All right, switching to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we saw a bit of a break in the number of new COVID-19 cases. The Department of Public Health reported about 2,400 new infections. Every day, the state releases a lot of information about coronavirus. But there is a series of charts posted on their website that continues to raise questions and frustration. Investigator Rebecca Lindstrom takes your questions to DPH for the answers tonight. Each day, the Department of Public Health creates these graphs and uses colors to try to give people a better understanding of what's happening in their community. For example, the map on the right is from today. The one on the left is from three weeks ago. They look exactly the same, even though we've had about 66,000 new cases. Kate wrote us asking about the logic, why the visual would not communicate the rising issues. The visual map is important for people who may not understand the other charts and numbers. 
Someone else noted the same thing on Twitter, this time with a map that shows the impact on counties based off their population size. They again noted a rise in cases, but no change in the maps. The reason the colors don't change is because DPH keeps bumping up the numbers needed to be in the red or dark blue. Look again. This morning, a county needed at least 9,732 cases to be shaded in red. On June 29th, that color represented any county with more than 5,469 cases. If the benchmark from the 29th were still being used today, Cobb County would be red instead of dark blue, and Chatham, Clayton, and Muskogee would join Hall County in the second highest tier. Which is why Pam wrote us saying, it appears like they're trying to hide the fact that our numbers are increasing. DPH insists that is not the case. Their data team argues we're missing the point of the maps. They say the colors are just there to differentiate between those areas most affected. If the state set a fixed scale, they argue, eventually the counts and rates will all work their way to a single color at the top end of the data range in the last bucket. Bottom line, the data ranges are going to keep changing, but the color in your county may not. The data and the graphics are only as good as our understanding of what they're trying to represent. And that's why we always welcome your questions. Tonight, another school district is walking back its plans to reopen as COVID-19 cases hit a new record high over the weekend. Gwinnett County Public Schools now going fully digital for at least the first several weeks of the upcoming school year. Originally, parents were given a choice of in-person or online learning. Still, educators in the county gathered for a rally this morning, saying there is a lot the district needs to address before classes start. Teachers say they want the option of working from home or from the classroom. And some say the digital divide is still a really big problem for a lot of kids in the district. Elwin Lopez walks us through it. There was inequity in education even before the pandemic. Now with online learning, there's growing concern some might fall behind even further. Access to a computer and internet seem nearly essential as COVID-19 continues to close classroom doors, shifting learning from a pencil to a click. But access has proven to be a challenge for many Hispanic and African American students. I feel like this is just another variable, another layer added that helps widen that gap. And then some of our kids might not ever get out of that and that definitely worries me. Nudie Castillo Crawford is an academic director at Gwinnett County Public Schools. She also leads the district's Hispanic mentorship program. I think all of us just want what's best for our kids. A survey by Somos found in April that amid the pandemic, nearly 40% of Latinos did not have broadband internet access at home and 32% did not have a computer. The divide is felt in Gwinnett County, where Hispanic and Latino students make up 32% of the district, compared to 21% who identify as Caucasian. And I had parents tell me, you know, we walked with a Chromebook to McDonald's and we sat outside in the parking lot, you know, not even in a car. And she was like, we sat outside with my two kids and we did, they did their work outside in a parking lot at McDonald's. As Gwinnett prepares for its public schools to start virtually, Castillo says the school district will provide hotspots and laptops to those in need, but there is still some concern for households with more than one student. You know, there's families that they have a elementary, middle school and high school kids and they cannot provide laptops. Probably they have one laptop for the whole entire family. Some educators also told me that another challenge that some parents faced when trying to gain internet access was that some of these companies were asking parents to provide their social security numbers. And while many immigrants don't even have one, others just didn't feel comfortable providing one. Some colleges are making the switch online. Morehouse, Spelman, and Clark Atlanta University are rethinking their decision to open right now. Instead, each school will go fully online with the fall. College presidents say this is because of a spike in COVID-19 cases, not just in Atlanta, but other states across the country too, that students may be traveling from. So in addition to data showing that African-American populations are more at risk for the virus, they have not yet made any decisions about the spring semest uh, semester. This announcement comes with a lot of changes to class schedules, including cutting out the fall break for more house students. So if you want more information, you can find it in the story on 11alive.com.
A man was in the hospital tonight after he was found shot in a car on I-20 at Glenwood Road this afternoon. Police uh, told us it appears that he was shot during a possible robbery at a nearby apartment complex, and he was trying to drive himself to the hospital. That's when he was discovered on the interstate. He is now listed in critical condition. Early voting has begun, and one of the largest polling places in the state is up and running. State Farm Arena was offered up as a way to accommodate a large number of voters while allowing for social distancing. The arena will be open from 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekdays and the next two Saturdays as well. Early voting for the Georgia general primary runoff election runs through August 7th. Eight-year-old Sicoria Turner's school took some time to remember her short life today. She was shot and killed while riding in the car with her mother on the 4th of July near the burned-out Wendy's on University Avenue. A 19-year-old now charged in her murder. Sicoria's classmates, teachers, and friends released balloons in the air in her memory. We're quiet in Atlanta right now, but on the north side, we have a few isolated showers that have some lightning with it. This one south of Rome, a lot of lightning with that. Stay with us. We'll let you know when these will die down and if we'll see additional storms redeveloping tomorrow. Coming up, Georgia Senator David Perdue on his plan to help students get back into the classroom, plus his thoughts on those extra unemployment funds from the federal government. <laughs> Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Tomorrow, a Fulton County Superior Court judge will hear arguments in the fight between Georgia's governor and Atlanta's mayor and city council, all this over COVID-19 guidelines. Governor Kemp is suing Mayor Bottoms over what he calls her unenforceable pandemic restrictions. Now, that includes a citywide mask mandate, which is stricter than the governor's statewide coronavirus orders. The governor's office says the lawsuit was brought on behalf of Atlanta business owners. You can read the full lawsuit as well as executive orders from the governor and the mayor on 11alive.com. You also will find a legal analysis of the lawsuit and its possible outcome. Today, the Senate is back in session and Congress starts hammering out the details of a second stimulus check. Senator David Perdue of Georgia is proposing $50 billion to support schools that make a plan to bring students back to class. It's called the School Act. Schools that open in person could apply for a grant, get support, connecting to health professionals and also gain access to a clearinghouse of ideas and information from other districts all around the country. Within the relief bill, there was also the question of the extra $600 a week those unemployment recipients are currently getting. That federal boost is set to end next week. The disincentive uh, that that 600 premium has uh, uh, been applied to is that it really has kept a lot of people in Georgia from coming back to work. Having said that, 
the unemployment benefits, not the premium, but the unemployment benefits for people who don't, who can't go back yet, uh, that's being looked at. I understand, and I do get those same calls from people who are having hard, a hard time accessing the benefits at the state level. But I believe we're working our way through that. And I, I, I still believe that the economy is gonna continue to reopen uh, at a pretty fast pace. Senator Perdue expects a vote on the second stimulus package within the next two weeks. It will still be a few more weeks before Americans receive money. Checks for the first stimulus were sent out 19 days after it became law. That will put this round arriving toward the end of August. Another hot, humid day. Oh, my, that's a shocking development here in Atlanta in late July. <laughs> Chris, how about relief? Is it called October or November? Yeah, surprise, surprise. Yeah, we have hot <laughs> heat, humidity, and pop-up showers out there. Now, some of these, even at this late night hour, this is usually when we see a lot of these dying out as we lose the heating of the day. But some of these storms are still holding together pretty well with some pockets of heavy rain and also some thunder and lightning. As I put this into motion, you can see that we don't have a big-time coverage of showers. The ones that we have over on the north side, are pretty much stationary, maybe drifting toward the north a little bit. Nothing going on in Atlanta right now. I want to take you up to this one up north of Cedartown between Lindale and Cedartown in the Cave Spring area. This was in northern Polk County earlier. It's still right on the Polk and Floyd County line. It's now drifting up into the southern parts of Floyd County. Has some really heavy rain with this. Not everybody, it's not a big storm, it's kind of small, but it's got that really heavy rain. And look at all the lightning, 15 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes just in that small little area between Cedartown, Cave Spring and Lindale. Again, that's drifting up toward the north. I just got some new information on this from the Weather Service saying about 40 mile an hour winds with this and they're saying it's pretty much stationary, but I am detecting a little bit of a drift to the north with that. Also some showers near Canton. These are dying out while these near Latham Town as you get up into the uh, Dawson County area near Ball Ground, some heavy rain. We have a little more thunder and lightning. That's really close to uh, Highway 369. And then also on the west end of Lake Lanier, here's Lake Lanier. There's coming for Scythe County. We have some heavy rain there with some thunder and lightning. That's on the west end of Lake Lanier, also moving up toward the north as well. A couple of additional showers there. Those also just kind of drifting to the north, not really moving a lot. And then elsewhere, nothing else in North Georgia or even on the south side. Now I'm about to show you kind of a dark tower cam. I'm, I'm doing this on purpose, okay? The reason, did you see that lightning? Okay, you see that? That's why I'm showing you this dark sky. Uh, when nothing's going on, of course, it's hard to see things. You see some of the buildings. This is in Rome, looking down toward the south into the southern end of the county there in Floyd County. And that's where we're seeing some of that thunder and lightning. We just saw a few of those flashes there. And again, we think that system is eventually going to uh, uh, die out and kind of rain itself out. Right now it's 84 degrees here in Atlanta. We have 84 in Athens. Rome, you're 85. Still really hot air all around. And it's very muggy out there and humid too. Tomorrow, another hot day. Today we hit 95. Tomorrow's going to be 94 on our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We're going to go with the 6, where we're going to see a few showers hours redeveloping once again in the afternoon. Tomorrow's rain chance a little higher than today. We'll go up to about a 40% chance for some showers. Dry early, lunchtime still dry. It's when we get that heat and humidity, really the heat of the day and all that humidity around is when we see those afternoon showers bubble up. We'll see that tomorrow afternoon dying out in the evening. And then we're going to do the same thing on Wednesday, a dry start in the afternoon thanks to the heat and humidity, some of those showers bubbling up. And we're going to keep that 40% not only for tomorrow and Wednesday, but also Thursday and Friday. Still going to be hot, 94 Tuesday, 93 Wednesday, 92 Thursday, 91 Friday. For the weekend, rain chance a little bit lower at 30% with highs right around 92 Saturday, 91 Sunday, back to 91 Monday again, but the rain chance back up again to about 40%. Take a look at your weather wow moment. Uh, this is a beautiful picture. This was sent in to us by Arisa Mendelson. This was taken up in the Sugar Hill area. I saw this exact same cloud last night from Gwinnett County. This is a iridescent Peleus cloud that um, is some high thin clouds above cumulus clouds. And where you have that, you've got some ice crystals there. And as the sun was setting, it was shining through those ice crystals, giving you some nice kind of rainbow colors at the top of that cloud. Looked really cool. Uh, had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, reaction to that on some pictures that we had on social media last night. We'd love to see your weather well mm -hmm. moment. We get a lot of these from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. You can uh, be a part of that group on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member, and we'll let you in to be a part of this exclusive local weather community. Still ahead, with so many districts going online in the fall, parents are forming learning pods, small groups of kids who have a privately hired teacher. 
but there are concerns this is just widening the education gap. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Many major school districts have announced they will be fully virtual in the fall, and now parents, they're scrambling, trying to figure out what exactly that's going to look like. One solution to form pods. Jeff, that's with four to five other kids in the same grade, and then you hire one adult to facilitate the virtual learning. But as Caitlin Ross reports, there are concerns that it could create an even bigger gap among students based on what families can afford to pay. Every single parent wants the best education for their child, but so many families are now left feeling like there are no good options now that all of the learning will be virtual. If parents have to return to work, who can supervise their kid and make sure they get the best education? No one has ever been in this situation. School districts, we've never seen this pandemic before. Ty Lewis is an educator and runs Educationally Speaking, a tutoring program for children. And even she's worried about what school will look like once her husband returns to work in person. We have two young children, and sometimes my mom is up here, and she has dementia, so she's high risk. She says the COVID-19 pandemic has turned education on its head. And now more than ever, families need to lean on each other to get through. A popular idea has been creating these learning pods for kids in the same grade. So when you're forming these villages, you're actually able to pull the resources from, again, educators and other people. She says most groups are forming online through Facebook and community organizers, but she's worried there will be inequity based on who is able to pay for something like that and who can't. Katie Whittlesley runs the nonprofit Education Cures and Homeschool Resource Academics Plus. She's worried about the same things. I've been fearful for our children. I mean, just absolutely terrified that there are so many, there's already a discrepancy. She says parents will have to advocate for their kids now that school will be online. We all have the power to make a difference in the life of one child, and it doesn't matter if you 
you are a teacher or you're just a mom who cares, I think that this is the time to really jump in and help someone else. A lot of parents are finding these groups through local parenting sites on Facebook or their community websites. Usually someone will offer to host four or five children and then they'll supervise that learning online. All right, Jeff, time for me to head out to get ready for Up Late coming up in about 30 minutes on 11 Alive. We'll see you there. Thank you, Aisha. We appreciate it. Have a good broadcast. We'll be looking for you on 11 Alive. Straight ahead on the Big 36, people in one Atlanta neighborhood fed up with street racers taking over their block night after night. Oh, man, it's hard to sleep when the party's on. Coming up, talking to neighbors about the problem and trying to get some answers from police. On WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to Tough times in Castleberry Hill right now for those who live there, and late night drag racing has become a thing. Large crowds and guns are leaving them in fear. 11 Alive Chenu Her spoke to some of those who live there, and he is live right now in Castleberry Hill in the community tonight, where you can still see some of those tire prints behind you forming that circle right behind you, Chenu. 
Yeah, Jeff, neighbors tell me this was happening Saturday night as well as last night. And just like you mentioned, right behind me, you can still see the tire marks in the street here at the intersection of Peter Street and Fair Street. Neighbors have reached out to us for weeks about this. Atlanta police say they responded Saturday night around 1030. When police showed up, a big crowd dispersed. One driver was issued a citation by EPD. State police handled a number of drivers of ATVs and a dirt bike. Neighbors in Castleberry Hill say they're tired of this. Late night, loud drag racing. Callie McConnell and her boyfriend George Boone live near the intersection of Peter Street and Fair Street. They say the drag racing has been going on for weeks. On Saturday, they saw and heard it outside their home. And it saw uh, a bunch of cars starting to pull up and starting to rev their engines and do burnouts on their, of their tires. She took this video showing a car doing donuts in the street surrounded by a huge crowd. This lasted for probably 45 minutes to an hour directly in front of where we live. Atlanta police say when they got on the scene, the crowd of people and cars scattered. Officers stopped multiple cars, one dirt bike and seven ATVs. APD cited one driver. Georgia State Police handled the rest. But neighbor Jacob Burkhardt says it was the same scene Sunday night in the same place. Another man who lives in that area sent us these videos he says he took Sunday night. They back up what Burkhardt describes. Burnouts, uh, commercial grade fireworks like those mortar shells um, that were going, you know, within feet of people's homes. Burkhardt says he called Atlanta police. In the same video taken by a man Sunday night, you can see police later blocking off the street. These neighbors are desperately asking for help, not wanting things to escalate. You saw people on the streets with guns, and you don't know what they're going to do. They could start shooting into our homes. There's just a lot of potential for things to go wrong. It wouldn't take much for something really bad to happen. Yeah, neighbors uh, say that they um, have called APD about this, and today we were in touch with APD. They say that they understand the frustrations uh, from these neighbors, and they will continue to work out in this area. Hill tonight. Thank you, Chanute. New tonight, former Atlanta police officer charged with murdering an African-American man in that Wendy's parking lot off University Avenue in June is now asking the district attorney be recused from the case. Garrett Rolfe shot and killed Rayshard Brooks on the night of June 12th while attempting to arrest him for DUI. He faces mel uh, felony murder and 10 other charges in connection with the case. Late this afternoon, Rolfe's attorneys filed a motion to have Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard removed from the case, saying he is systematically seeking to deny Rolfe a fair trial. The motion also claims that Howard has a conflict of interest because he is being investigated by the GBI in relation to this case. Rolfe is currently out on bond. The DA's office released a statement saying they will not comment on the motion until it is assigned to a Superior Court judge. It's been said more testing will lead to the diagnosis of COVID-19 cases. That is true. In the past month, testing has increased 35%, but new cases have risen 45%, a sign this is about more than test availability. That is why we should pay close attention to the number of active patients, regardless of whether if you've had a test, if you're sick enough to need medical care, then you're going to go to the hospital. That number keeps rising. Today, Georgia Emergency Management reported 3,183 active COVID-19 patients. That's nearly 150 patients more than yesterday. EMA says that in Health Region D, which covers most of the metro, 16% of ICU beds are open and the emergency rooms have plenty of space. Still, three hospitals had to divert ambulances at some point today to other locations and seven reported that their ICUs were full. Diversions can happen when a hospital doesn't have enough beds, equipment or staff. We don't know how much of that is due to increased COVID-19 patients, but it does show the strain that these new cases add to the system. Now to Gwinnett County, where we have seen one of the biggest jumps in new cases. The virus hit one home in the county particularly hard, infecting half of the family members who live inside. Natisha Lance spoke to the matriarch pulling double duty as mother and doctor. It's been really hard, really, really hard. 
Um, trying to keep everyone with the mask on, trying to keep everyone distant is really hard. For nearly a month, Jennifer Santana has not been able to hug or kiss her children. We're a family. We're used to doing everything together. You name it, we do it together. Now add to the list tackling a pandemic. Six out of 12 family members living in the same house tested positive for COVID-19. It started with Jennifer's oldest daughter. She had been sick and we thought it was just morning sickness. At five months pregnant, the 22 year old was the first in the family to receive the news. Then it spread. Three, four days later, we all ended up sick. Like half of us ended up sick. Luckily, no one has needed to go to the hospital, but they have experienced symptoms. You can't breathe. Um, you have back pain. It feels like you pulled the muscle and it doesn't matter how you move, where you move to, how you sit, it, it, it hurts. The adults and teens in the family work fast food jobs. Since they can't work, money is tight. And then nobody's been working for a month now, so there's no money coming in. You know, we have rent. The timeline to get back to work keeps getting pushed back. Jennifer's 15-year-old daughter tested positive for the virus last week, restarting the clock on another 14-day quarantine. New tonight, as New York City entered a new phase of reopening today, Governor Andrew Cuomo headed south to Savannah on a mission, he says, to prevent the virus from returning to the Northeast. He spoke with NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is still on the move, even though most of his state is no longer at a standstill. Why head down to Georgia today? Uh, Georgia has a real problem. We rode with the governor on a chartered flight down to Savannah, Georgia, among the many states now battling a dramatic surge. And it's so unnecessary in a way, right, because we, we knew what we needed to do. Today, Cuomo met with Savannah's Democratic mayor, who's been sharply critical of Georgia's Republican governor, who's refused to mandate masks. Healthcare professionals say this can save lives. Uh, healthcare researchers say if we had a national mask policy, we would save 40,000 lives. Back in April, New York State saw more than 800 COVID deaths a day. Today, that number is down to eight. Months ago, thousands of volunteers rushed to New York to help fight the virus. Now, the state has sent PPE, medication, test kits, and contact tracers to new hotspots in Georgia, Florida, and Texas. Cuomo dismisses the Trump administration's insistence that more cases are simply do to more testing. This president has refused to accept reality. He is still in denial about the COVID virus. But Cuomo has also faced controversy himself for ordering COVID patients to be transferred from hospitals to nursing homes back in March to free up bed space. Critics say that decision costs lives, though the governor strongly disputes that. If you had to do it over again, would you have issued that same directive or was it a mistake? We looked at this factually. If you look at when the nursing home deaths happened, it has no correlation to that order. Where the spread came from were from the workers. There's a chance that the virus may have come from visitors early on. Well, we spent a lot of time talking about Congressman John Lewis and the fight for civil rights. But a very big part of his life was a successful part of his life as an Atlanta City Councilman from 1981 through the mid 80s. And what he was able to accomplish there for the neighborhoods in town is so very significant. Without John Lewis, okay, Virginia Highland, Morningside, Ponce Highland, Ponce City Market, Inman Middle School, uh, Morningside Elementary, maybe even Grady High School, greatly change maybe not there at all as you remember the issue with i-485 and the six lanes that was going to be coming through those in-town neighborhoods after a 1960s federal report showed them as blighted neighborhoods not worth putting the money into well john lewis sided with the activists including mary davis who would become a congresswoman uh, would become a, a city councilwoman as well and if not for john lewis how different would our city look in terms of the canopy of trees, in terms of the base of, of taxes. Uh, it's an extraordinary story and, and one that certainly we all have been talking about over the past weekend or so. This I-475, 675, uh, Mr. Lewis opposed it and he helped broker an alternative use for that space 
which then turned into Freedom Parkway, opening in the 1990s before the Olympics, with a green space with what later became the Carter Center. Freedom Parkway, of course, was named for Congressman Lewis in 2018. A man goes to a federal judge's home, shoots her husband, kills her son. What police are saying about the motive tonight. We're still getting a lot of lightning in a lone cell up near Rome in Floyd County. Another one just west of Lake Lanier that still has some lightning with it. Stay with us. We'll let you know when those showers will die out and when more will redevelop. And coming up in sports, an update about high school football. Where is that going with the pandemic all around us? Body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in The search for a man who carried out a daylight gun attack at a federal judge's home in New Jersey appears to be over. Investigators at a scene in rural Sullivan County, New York, where a man has been found dead apparently by his own hand. Police trying to figure out whether the gun found there was the same one Sunday night at the home of a federal judge whose 20 year old son was killed and husband critically wounded. Here's NBC's Chris Pallone. 
Law enforcement sources tell NBC News they believe a well-known New York attorney, Roy Dan Hollander, found dead of an apparent suicide in the state's Catskill Mountains, is the same person who carried out a shooting attack at a federal judge's home in New Jersey Sunday night. The discovery of Hollander's body came as the U.S. Marshal Service, the FBI, state and local police spent the day combing a North Brunswick, New Jersey neighborhood for clues. After a man said to be posing as a FedEx delivery driver went to the home of federal judge Esther Salas Sunday night and shot her husband and son when they came to the door. I don't think Esther had an enemy in the world. Three law enforcement sources told WNBC Salas was in the home's basement when the shooting happened around 5 Sunday afternoon. My neighbors said they heard, heard five or six gunshots happen. Salas's husband, defense attorney Mark Anderl, and their son Daniel were shot several times. Just gut wrenching. The city's mayor at a loss to explain why this happened. For such devoted, accomplished, good people, it's just unthinkable. President Obama appointed Salas to the federal bench in 2010, the first Hispanic woman ever to serve in that role in New Jersey. Salas presided over several high-profile cases, including the trial of one of the Real Housewives of New Jersey and a current lawsuit against Deutsche Bank. And while Hollander has a long history of filing anti-feminist lawsuits, the motive for the attack is still unclear. Those showers on the north side that still have some heavy rain and thunder and lightning with them are showing signs of weakening somewhat. We don't have really much going on here in Atlanta or on the south side over to the west of us in Carroll County. A few light showers, but most of those isolated heavier showers are to the north of us. I want to start with that one in northwest Georgia that has just moved out of Polk County into the southern parts of Floyd County. Uh, this had a lot of lightning with it just a little while ago. Now that lightning count is down with that one cell between Rome and Cave Spring. And then there's another one that just developed in the northwestern corner or northeastern corner of Rome and the northwestern corner of Bartow County. That's starting to get some heavy rain with it and lightning. So both of these put together have about 12 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. So if you're in northwest Georgia, you might be hearing some lightning, uh, hearing some thunder or seeing some lightning in the distance there. These showers in the northern parts of Forsyth County and southern parts of Dawson County are starting to die out. We still have about four lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. This is again in uh, parts of Forsyth County on the west end of Lake Lanier and the northern part of Lake Lanier where we have a few of those showers. But again, those are fading out pretty much just drifting to the north. These showers generally just develop and they bubble up with the heat and humidity and then just rain themselves out as they drift up to the north and then around the rest of the area. Nothing else is really going on. I want to take you out there live right now. This is our live view in Rome. Earlier we were watching I know this is a dark tower cam, but we're, it's a dark sky on purpose because we can see those lightning strikes there in the distance. That's why I'm showing you this, but we're not seeing as many now as we did a little bit earlier. I want to take you down to the tropics because things are getting a little bit active. We have three potential systems that we're watching. This one right here off the coast of Texas most likely is going to move inland and it only has about a 10% chance of development over the next two to five days. There is another one near Cuba. As this gets into the Gulf of Mexico, it has a 20 to 30% chance of developing over the next two to five days. And then there's yet another area that we're watching a little tropical wave out in the mid Atlantic. It also has about a 20% chance of developing there. So, you know, we're at the getting closer to the end of July, usually in August and September things start to ramp up a little bit more and we are seeing a little more activity that we'll have to keep an eye on back here at home though any showers that are out there tonight are dying out in the morning it's going to be the typical day with a dry start it's going to be very muggy at lunchtime we see a few more clouds around and then in the afternoon a few of those scattered showers start to develop with that heat and humidity bubbling things up and that's going to be the same story for Wednesday as well those days will go with a 40% chance for showers, also a 40% chance for showers Thursday and Friday. Still going to be really hot and humid though, 94 for a high Tuesday, holding generally in the lower 90s Thursday and Friday. We do go down to a 30% chance for showers Saturday and Sunday, so yeah, still some scattered showers, but that rain chance a little bit lower, then back to 40% again on Monday with highs near 91. It was very important to our trustees and to all of our coaches across the state that we have a full 10 game season and a full playoff season. Dr. Robin Hines, the executive director of the GHSA today, the GHSA board of trustees voted to delay the start of the 2020 football season by two weeks, but they also voted for a full 
10 game regular season and full playoffs. They are ever the optimists. Football practices around the state will begin on July 27th. The first regular season games are slated for September 4th. The reason for the two week delay is to allow players to get acclimated safely. All of this is good news for coaches and players who are looking forward to a full season. We're definitely happy about that. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely happy for my seniors. Um, you know, the class of 2021, because the class of 2020 got, you know, uh, robbed of a lot of, you know, great moments like prom and, you know, walking across the stage, graduation. I just did not want that to happen to the class of 2021. The phone's blown up with players and community and coaches. And, uh, yes, it's been uh, a neat excitement that we need in this time right now because, you know, for, for just for our, our mindsets. Yeah, but the numbers are showing something totally different, guys. News of the decision brings a lot of different reaction and even some concern for what is to come this fall. Maria Martin spoke with a coach and an athletic director on what this decision means for everybody involved. The, the commitment was to try to find a way to play the full 10 game regular season and the full playoffs. The GHSA Board of Trustees decision on the upcoming fall season means football is happening, just getting pushed back a few weeks. It's going to be tough to keep them motivated moving that back. You have to look on the bright side. They haven't canceled the season. Fulton County Athletic Director Stephen Kraft said that this was the best way for there to be hope for a season for everyone. If we just stuck to the original schedule, then some districts probably would have chosen right out of the gate to cancel, and they may, may still choose to do that. I'm all for it if those are the reasons why we're doing it. When it comes to logistics, Harrison head coach Matt Dickman said they haven't had a positive COVID case yet. But he did say that things will get trickier once the season gets going. What have you learned and how to navigate that situation as that quickly approaches? Well, the, the biggest thing is just telling them how we have to be safe. And if we want this to work, we have to work together by doing those things and being cautious. I think we're going to have a big challenge when we get into the season and somebody gets COVID on your team. Uh, who's, you know, is it just going to be the one person? We don't even have all those details yet right now. All right. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers. That is uh, it for us, right? Are we all set tonight? Let's do this. Let's end on this. Tonight, let's leave you with uh, a, a view of the late Congressman John Lewis. Here goes. John Lewis breaking it down to the song Happy, and that is Representative Hank Johnson along with him. And just... Uh, a moment to look at him and to miss him and appreciate all that he has meant to so many, not only in our country, but my goodness, what he's meant to us here in Atlanta and Georgia throughout the generations. Chris. We're going to keep watching those skies out there in the afternoons and evenings with the heat and humidity. We're going to have scattered showers developing 40% chance for that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Still really hot mid 90s Tuesday, 93 Wednesday down to 92 Thursday, 91 Friday. Rain chance goes down a little bit Saturday and Sunday to 30%, then back up to 40% Monday with high temperatures right around 91 in the afternoons, both Sunday and Monday. All right, that's it for us. Thanks for watching 11 Alive Prime Time. Switch over to 11 Alive now for Up Late with Aisha and Ron. .gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.